Well, good morning. We welcome you on this beautiful Sunday morning. A uh, busy day at Zion today. Uh, had our confirmation class this morning. I, I think I got myself in trouble, though, because uh, I asked the kids, how many of you have parents who want you to be here but don't come on Sunday morning? And I said, go home and ask them, why do I have to go and you don't? So, But I said, do it in a nice way. So we'll continue confirmation next week. Uh, youth tonight here, 5 o'clock. Uh, after, uh, oh, also Lynn has her piano recital uh, this afternoon at 3.30. And we've got two students, Antoine and, no? Three. Three. Clarissa. Oh, Clarissa. That's right. Clarissa, Antoine, and Bobby will be playing this afternoon. So that's 3.30 here. Uh, Saturday, of course, is the fall festival. And I think there's going to be a very short meeting afterwards. Uh, Beverly and Lynn and Darlene and Patty and anybody else, I think, that wants to come. Who else? Aaron. Oh, and Aaron. And anybody else that wants information about that, about what we're supposed to be doing or what we still need and that kind of thing. So that will be right after the service. Uh, and, and the fall festival's uh, Saturday, 10 to 4. Uh, Tuesday, of course, jail ministry at 1. Bible study at 6.30 here, also Zoomed. We're reading something called the Gospel of Mary, which you may be thinking, wait a minute, I didn't know Mary had a gospel. Well, come and find out. And it's sewing day. Wednesday is sewing day. Thank you. Wednesday is sewing day. Appreciate that. <laughs> Uh, I, I was asked by Pastor Randy, the week of October 23rd, he's going to be here. He's going to stay with me a couple days. But he was also asking to see if there's anybody that had a spare bedroom he could use for a couple days. He's worried about, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Overstaying is welcome with us. So if you've got a spare bedroom for a couple days he could stay in, uh, please let me know and I'll pass that along to him. Uh, prayers, we continue to pray for Wilbur and his mother, for those with cancer, including Patricia and Mike. Saw Mike this week. Is he here this morning? Good, good to see you, Mike. He's doing pretty well, all things considered. For Beverly, for Bruno, for my pastor friend Eric, for Jim and myself. Uh, Janet Theobald, continue to need prayers for her. Uh, for Janet Robinson, uh, Jerry Kuhn, talk to Jerry post-surgery. He's doing pretty well. We need to continue to pray for revival in this congregation, for our fall festival, and certainly for the people of Florida. We've had people here who were affected. Uh, the Adkins, you had some structural damage to a place you've got down there. We'll also put... Um, the Addisons on that list. That's my brother's in-laws. They live on Sanibel Island and just barely got out. And so they don't even know if they have a home. And so now they're living with him for a little while up in Carmel. And he didn't, they just basically ran. And I don't even think he had time to bring insurance papers or anything. So were there other people related to that? Uh, yeah, so What's her name? Uh, Chelsea. 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 Okay. Yeah, she, they lost their everything. Yeah, I can imagine. The scenes looked pretty bad. Well, in, in fairness, no one really knew it was going to hit there. They, they had very little time. But yes, if you could just put Chelsea. Okay, there, we'll do that. Okay. With the Addisons and the Atkins. Okay. Um, birthdays this week. Patty Higgins has. Oh, I'm sorry. Family. Who? Lana husband and her. Family. That's right. That's they right. How are they? How close are they to that? Okay. All right. We'll certainly put them on. 
Uh, again, Patty has a birthday this week. Brian Harker. Riker? Riker's with us this morning, right? I thought he was. Okay. Uh, are there any other prayer requests or announcements or anything? Announcements? Yes. We're going to try to have a cemetery meeting briefly after church. Cemetery board meeting after church briefly? Yes. Brad, the uh, prayer This is a recipe for the dream sickle cake, poke cake. So if you're confused about that, see Janet. Yes, ma'am. Our daughter in law, Kelly, lost her mom, and um, it's been about a week, but she's struggling. Um, her mother had Alzheimer's, and uh, it, it's just a rough patch. So thank you for prayer. Certainly. Yes. No, I just wanted to tell you that the clipboard is going around again for fall beds. There are still some missing spots. Um, also, um, just make sure if you're donating food or if you're volunteering with food, um, whatever the case may be, that the food is there by the Friday morning as we will do prep for the fall festival Friday night. And that food, segregated food out of the fortune, prepping them for serving and stuff like that. So okay. Fall Festival food needs to be in by Friday. All right, well, let's go ahead and lift up uh, our brothers and sisters then in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the opportunity to come and worship you today in freedom and without fear. We remember our brothers and sisters who do not have the opportunity to do that, asking that you give them courage and strength. We continue to pray for healing in the lives of Wilbur and his mother. For Patricia and Mike and Beverly and Bruno, for Eric and Jim and myself, and all suffering from cancer, Lord, that you would bring remission, healing, and hope. We pray for Janet Theobald as she transitions into a new living situation, Lord, and continue to pray for her family. Pray for Janet Robinson, for Jerry, Lord, as he recovers from surgery. We pray for our fall festival this weekend, Lord, that you would bless it and make it successful uh, and that it would be of a great benefit, not just to this congregation, but certainly to our youth as well. We continue to pray for revival for this church, Lord, that you would pour your Holy Spirit upon us, that every heart would be turned toward you with a desire to serve you and to build this church and grow with it. We Remember those afflicted by this terrible hurricane, Lord, that you would comfort the dead or comfort the uh, relatives of the dead, those who are in grief and sorrow. For those who are still living and suffering through the difficulties of displacement and dislocation, we pray for them, especially the Addisons, Lord, but also lifting up the Adkins and Chelsea and Lana and her family that you would continue to lead and guide them during these difficult days. For all who are grieving and in sorrow, Lord, especially for Kelly, that you would be with them to fill them with your loving presence and remind them of your continuing care. We thank you for another year of life for Patty and Brian and Riker and ask your blessing upon them as their years increase. And we pray all these things, Lord, in the name of Jesus and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And as we prepare to come into the presence of the living God, I would ask that we all spend a few minutes in silent prayer and meditation. Amen. This time I would ask those who are able to please stand for our call to worship and remain standing for our opening hymn.
and for our statement of faith. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you are the word that brings life. Let your word come down to us again this day as we come to worship you in spirit and in truth. Bless our time together this morning that we may experience your power, majesty, and grace. We praise you with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And our opening hymn is on page 793. Let us express our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the one holy universal Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated.
That's it. And Allie and Luke, thank you. And Kayla. <laughs> no, I was kidding. You can sit. I was kidding. It was, it was a joke. Joke. Can you imagine? <laughs> Hi, guys. Hi. Um, okay, so we're going to start this off um, kind of ambiguous. Do you guys know what a compromise is? You guys don't want to compromise this? You've never compromised? Have you ever divided something in half? Right? You have siblings, right? Have you ever had to share something with a sibling? Yeah, me too. I have a twin. I don't like to share now. What happens is you guys disagree a lot, right? I know that you definitely bicker with your sister a lot, Kevin. You guys bicker a lot? Yeah? Have you ever got an argument together? Yeah? Who won? You, <laughs> somehow I believe this. Um, that's okay, Abby always wins. It's, it's girl power. Um, but what do you do, right, when you win? You do something that you were taught, right? At the end of a game, when somebody loses a game, what do you say? Good game, yes, why do we do that? To do what? Show God's love, right? We talked about this in confirmation. But when you're in an argument with each other, what was the last thing that you and Luke argued over? Make it good. The whole world's watching. Was it a TV show? Video game? A game? It was a game? Yeah, about who won the game? No? Have you guys ever played Monopoly? Yeah? Do you know who wins in Monopoly? The person with the most money. Yeah. Yeah. Can you compromise on that? Can you say, hey, Luke, I'm sorry you lost. Here's like 20 bucks. Can you do that? No? Okay. Well, I'm the only one that feels sorry then. Right? But there's certain things you can't compromise on. You can't compromise on who won the game. But what you can do is say, hey, good game. Right? What can you not compromise on? more than anything. Somebody know? What can you not compromise on, Kevin? What will me, as your youth director, refuse to compromise on? You guys. What if somebody, we talked about this in confirmation, what if somebody paid me $1,000 to quit my job? I wouldn't do it. Why? Because I won't compromise on you guys. Right? What if someone says, Beverly, I'll pay you a million dollars as long as you just stop being a youth director, what would I do? I'd be like, wow, is there any other way I could get that? Because I'm not quitting my job, right? Why will I not quit on my job for you guys? I do love you guys, yeah. But more importantly, I love God, yeah. And God has called me to be a youth director, right? Do you think that I'm a youth director because it's so fun? No, Kevin is strong now. Um, no, right? Because I believe in God. Yes, good job, guys. Right. So I won't compromise on what? You guys, because I won't compromise on my faith. Because I believe in God, and I believe in what he's called me to do with you guys. And I believe in building your faith up. Can you imagine if there was a price tag on my faith? That would mean that you'd be worth... What's like 10 of a billion? It's just, right? But that's how much you'd be worth, right? If I had a price tag on my faith, do you guys ever feel like that? There's things that you won't compromise on. There's things you shouldn't compromise on, right? What your parents have taught you, don't curse in school. Don't yell at people. Let elderly people sit down before you, right? Those are all God's love. And as you get older, those are things we won't compromise on. Those are values, Kevin. We need to teach you those a little bit. Right? Right. So I want you, when you guys are behaving in the world, when you're doing what you're told, when you're doing your homework, when you're sharing with your siblings, right? Those are showing God's love. And you don't compromise on that. Even if winning a Monopoly game is something you won't compromise on either. Right? All right, let's pray. Dear God... Thank you for showing us the difference between compromising in life and compromising on your love. Show us 
how to love others like you taught us. Amen. Good job, guys. If there was a video game version of Monopoly, maybe they played it. Uh, for our success story today, it was a good Tuesday for Zion. Jail ministry went well. Uh, again, there's like two kind of guys that are very consistent, but when we pray at the end, everybody comes up. They all want a part of that. So it's, it's a great blessing. I want to talk a little more, though, about Laundry Love, because we had a Laundry Love Tuesday. I understand it was a busy day, Patty? It was busy. Uh, I don't know how much we spent. Non-stop busy. Non busy on Tuesday. And uh, it, it isn't really so much a measure of how much we spend, but how many lives we're touching. And I, and I think even if people don't come right out and say it, they, they are getting something out of it beyond the monetary value. So thank you to all the volunteers who were there. And Patty, for you, for kind of... Uh, leading that. We're very grateful and uh, it is a tremendous success in terms of a ministry for this congregation. Our service now continues with our gathering prayer. Let us pray. Remember your creator in the days of your youth before the days of trouble come. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. On Amen. Our scripture reading this morning, the first one, is from Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 1 to 2, and verses 9 to 14. Now, Israel, hear the decrees and laws I am about to teach you. Follow them so that you may live and go in and take possession of the land of the Lord, the God of your ancestors, is giving you. Do not add to what I command you and do not subtract from it, but keep the commands of the Lord your God that I give you. Only be careful and watch yourselves closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them fade from your heart as long as you live. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. Remember the day you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb when he said to me, Assemble the people before me to hear my words so that they may learn to revere me as long as they live in the land and may teach them to their children. You came near and stood at the foot of the mountain while it blazed with fire to the very heavens, with black clouds and deep darkness. Then the Lord spoke to you out of the fire. You heard the sound of words but saw no form. There was only a voice. He declared to you his covenant, the Ten Commandments, which he commanded you to follow and then wrote them on two stone tablets. And the Lord directed me at that time to teach you the decrees and laws you are to follow in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess. And from Revelation chapter 2, verses 12 to 17. To the angel of the church in Pergamum write, These are the words of him who has the sharp, double-edged sword. I know where you live where Satan has his throne. Yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city, where Satan lives. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught immorality, I'm sorry, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food sacrificed to idols and committed sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those to hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. 
Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. Here ends our lesson for today. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. We do have an election coming up pretty soon. And whether you're a Republican or a Democrat or an Independent or whatever, I think there's one thing we can agree on. And that is that the level of our political discourse has gotten very, very low. We don't talk to one another anymore. We don't try to work out differences. We don't sit down and discuss things. Instead, we shout at each other, usually over the top of each other's heads. And all we're trying to do, it seems like, is overpower the other side. And to the extent that anything gets done, legislatively. It's not because people are willing to sit down and work out differences. It's because one side gets enough power where it can force its opinion on the other side. And that's what happens when you get into a situation where both sides feel they are absolutely right and moral and good and the other side is absolutely wrong, if not outright evil. We have, in a very real sense, lost the ability to compromise. We have lost the ability to come to agreement. Compromise is something we hold very dear in our culture. It is a pillar of a civilized society. And it is something we teach our young children at a very early age. If there are two kids and one toy, and they are fighting over it, usually there's some kind of compromise involved. All right, Billy, you get it for 15 minutes and play with it, and then we'll stop, and then Johnny, you get it for 15 minutes. That's the essence of compromise. And again, that is something that we hold in our culture to be very important. But the question comes up, is compromise always good? Is it always the right thing to do? And that's what we want to think about in the context of our readings this morning as we continue our series on the letters to the seven churches, this time with the third letter to the church at Pergamum. Now, like the other churches, Pergamum was in ancient Greece, now is in westernmost Turkey. It was an important trade route at the time because of its location on the Aegean Sea. And like the other letters, God speaking through the Apostle John begins with commendation, good news. He commends them for their faith, even though, he says, you are living in the home of Satan. He says that twice which is just another way of saying there's a lot of evil going on in that area. There's a lot of sin, and yet there is this group of believers in Pergamum that is holding fast, and that is holding out. But also, as with the other letters, we then see the letter turn. And God brings up a critical point. He wants the people of Pergamum to think about, and I think we need to think about it as well. And that's what we see in Revelation chapter 2, verses 14 to 16, and specifically where it says, there are some who hold to the teaching of Balaam. Now, Balaam is one of those names you have heard before, but probably don't remember. He's in the Old Testament a lot. 
specifically in Numbers chapters 20 through to 26. And you most likely remember the story of Balaam and his donkey, who were going down the road, and Balaam was hitting the donkey, and all of a sudden the donkey talks back to him. Why are you hitting me? And then an angel of the Lord comes and rebukes Balaam for what he has done. Balaam was a prophet, but at the same time, something of a mercenary. He had hired himself out to the other kingdoms and principalities in the area as an advisor. As a matter of fact, when he was with his donkey, he was on the road to go see the king of Moab. The king of Moab wanted him to curse the Israelites. And Balaam, to his credit, refused. But he also engaged in other detestable practices. Enticing the people of Israel to walk away from the faith. He was in cahoots with these other leaders to try to get them to use their women to attract the Israelite men and pull them away from what they were doing. It was mentioned that he was encouraging the eating of food sacrificed to idols and other practices of sexual immorality. And for all of this, a curse was placed on the nation of Israel in Numbers chapter 31. And Balaam is mentioned twice in the New Testament. In 2 Peter 2 and in the letter to Jude, and in both cases he's mentioned in the sense of, don't do this. Don't be like Balaam. Don't do what he did. And what he was doing when you boil it down was he was compromising with the kingdoms and principalities and cultures around him and encouraging the Israelites to do the same. And so the warning here is the same warning to us today. Do not compromise your faith. There are some things in life we simply cannot compromise, as good as compromise is. Now, just as you remember the story of Balaam and his donkey, I'm sure you remember the story of King Solomon and the two women and the baby. That was back in 1 Kings 3. There were two women. Each had a baby. One of the babies died. So now there's two women and one baby, and both women want to claim the baby as their own. Now Solomon, of course, had been given incredible wisdom by God. He had prayed for wisdom as a child. He became one of the wisest men in the world. And he often sat in judgment over disputes like this. So they brought the women before him. And Solomon said, I know what we'll do. We'll compromise. We'll cut the remaining baby in half. And we'll give one half to one woman and one half to another. Now the first woman, who obviously was not the mother, said, Yeah, that seems like a great idea. Let's do that. But the second woman, who obviously was the mother, said, no, don't harm the baby. I'd rather see the baby go to her than the baby be harmed. So Solomon rightly decided that the second woman must be the mother and awarded her the baby. In that situation, no compromise is possible. You can't cut a baby in half. Well, I suppose you could, but you really shouldn't. And it's a reminder to us that there are areas of our lives where compromise simply is not possible. So what are those areas? I think there are four. Four main areas where God is calling us not to compromise. One would be what we call the essentials of our faith. The basic foundational doctrinal beliefs of who we are and what we believe in God. On Wednesday nights, on our Bible study at 6.30, which I encourage you to attend, the last couple of weeks we've been looking at some early church heresies. People who came up with very strange ideas about who God is 
and who Jesus is. And these heresies were rightly stamped out by the church fathers, even though they keep popping up even today. Because we must continue to defend the essentials of our faith. What are those essentials? That there is one God who is majestic and powerful and holy and eternal and righteous, who existed before anything was, who created everything, including us, who gave us free will. And when we walked away in sin and disobedience, who had every right to punish us in his perfect wrath and judgment, but instead, in his grace and mercy, sent his son Jesus to live and die for us, to take our sins upon himself, to take our punishment and our guilt upon himself. And when the same Jesus returned to his rightful throne in heaven, God sent himself in the form of the Holy Spirit to be our counselor and guide until such time as Jesus returns to judge all mankind to reward the faithful with eternal life in heaven to punish the unfaithful with eternal condemnation in hell to defeat Satan once and for all and to create a new heaven and a new earth those are the essentials of our faith that everyone should be able to articulate and that everyone should be willing to defend without compromise. So that's the first area. We do not compromise the essentials of our faith. We do not compromise the inerrancy of Scripture. We do not compromise what's in here. This is not just a book written by 35 different people. It has 35 different writers, but one author, God. We believe that God, speaking through the Holy Spirit, communicated His perfect, inerrant, and infallible will to us. It is perfect, it is infallible, and it is inerrant. All of it. Not some of it. There is a tendency today among people, and sadly enough among churches, to ignore certain parts of the Bible that they don't like or that make them feel uncomfortable. If you can't believe all of the Bible, you can't believe any of it. That's also the point being made in Deuteronomy from our Old Testament lesson. Don't take anything away from it. Don't subtract anything from it. It is perfect just the way it is. That's the message we preach, that these are not words on a page, but this is the living God speaking to his people. And we cannot compromise that. The third thing, the third area, I believe, where we cannot compromise is our call from Jesus to go out and tell others about him. There is a tendency today to think that evangelism and spreading the good news and sharing the gospel is simply the job of the pastor or the youth director or the council. It is for everyone. When Jesus says in Matthew 28, 19, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, He's not just talking to the people who are hearing Him at the time. He's talking to all of us. All of us have not just that responsibility, but all of us have that opportunity to go share the good news of Jesus. And I do not believe that is something we should compromise by saying, I'm embarrassed, I'm shy, I don't feel right, I don't uh, feel qualified to do it. That is a command for all people. And finally, the fourth area, what has loosely been termed the world, the flesh, and the devil, which I think is really the main point of this letter to the church at Pergamum. We cannot compromise 
with a world that seeks to pull us away from our faith, from a world that is constantly trying to get us to abandon what we believe in. We cannot compromise with a world that keeps telling us, why do you go to church? Why do you believe in that? We cannot compromise with the flesh and the desires of the flesh, which are set in opposition to living in the Spirit. And we cannot compromise with the temptations of Satan. All three of these, the world, the flesh, and the devil, are constantly whispering in our ear, it's okay. Everybody's doing it. If you're not hurting anybody, what difference does it make? Nobody's looking. Those are the temptations we are constantly hearing from the world, the flesh, and the devil, and we cannot compromise with that and shall not. We are obviously talking about compromise this morning and when we should compromise and when we should draw a line in the sand and refuse to compromise. But we have to be careful. We ran into a situation here in this congregation earlier this year where some people drew a line in the sand and refused to compromise. Not because it was necessarily good for the church and not because it was necessarily in keeping with the Bible or in trying to spread the name of Jesus. But I believe there were people, and perhaps still are, who refused to compromise simply out of sinful, stubborn pride. Because they thought their opinion was the only one that mattered. And they refused to listen to anybody else. This congregation, this church can't survive with that kind of attitude. Yes, there are times we are called not to compromise, to hold the line. But if you're ever confused, if you're ever wondering, is this a time and place for that, ask yourself this. Am I refusing to compromise because it's best for me, or for my opinion, or my position, like we talked about with the politicians? Or am I refusing to compromise because it's what God wants? There are areas of our lives where we are called not to compromise. The essentials of our faith. We cannot compromise the inerrancy of Scripture. We cannot compromise Jesus' call to go out into the world. And we cannot compromise against the culture. It all comes down to Jesus. We can't compromise what we believe about him. We can't compromise what he did and what he said. We can't compromise his call on our lives. And we can't compromise against those who are seeking to pull us away from him. So when you're thinking about where your line in the sand is, ask yourself, who's on the other side of the line? Is it me or is it Jesus? Amen. Our sermon hymn is on page 312.
Our service continues with our prayer on page 314. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, which is life itself, able to shatter rock and bring fire, able to pierce bone and joint and marrow. Let us ever hold fast to your word, never compromising what you have told us, never compromising the essentials of our faith never compromising Jesus' call to go out into the world and never compromising against the temptations of that world. In all other areas, Lord, give us a heart that is willing to compromise and listen and hear others and their points of view. Give us tongues that are civil and spirits filled with a desire for peace and reconciliation. We thank you and praise you and ask your blessing as we move forward in the name of Jesus. And we now pray together the prayer that he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. A reminder is the plates come through uh, of our obligation, uh, not just our responsibility, but our opportunity to give back to God in some small portion the blessings he has showered upon us.
As I ask the council to come forward, please be seated. As I ask the council to come forward, as we prepare for communion, I would encourage you to take a few moments here of silent prayer and especially consider the words of Paul that each person should examine himself before partaking of the bread and the cup, lest he eat and drink condemnation upon himself. Amen. As we prepare to come to the Lord's table, let us pray together our prayer of confession. O Lord, in, we confess to you our sins and disobedience. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. Yet we come to this table knowing that we can find grace in mercy through Jesus. Restore and forgive us in his name and through his body and blood. Amen.